Hey, this is Alec. Welcome to White Whale Comics. And welcome to my first official episode of my artist review series. And the artist I've selected for the first episode is Mike Mignola, who you may have heard of. Uh, he is one of my favorite artists, and so I thought it was appropriate to start with someone who I really love and admire. Well, not him. I mean, he seems perfectly nice, but uh, his work. Let me let me rephrase that. I wanted to start with someone's work who I really love and admire. That sounds better. So I've broken uh, this up kind of into two halves. The first half is based on talking about his style and his stylistic choices, and the second half will be about his storytelling. So let's chat about his style. It is a very strong and distinctive style. You really can't mistake his work. Even people who have tried to emulate his work, you can immediately see that it's not quite right. You know, I, I happen to really, really like his style, but the f fact that he has a distinctive style is something that draws me to him. When an artist has a very distinct style, it is definitely a positive in my book. I feel that any time someone tries to do something unique or individualized to them, individualized, that's not a word, you know what I mean. Someone who has a, a style that is completely their own. And I think Mike Mignola is, is really near the top of that list, if not at the top of that list, where he has developed a style that is completely unique to him. And you can see he uses these really strong blacks and white. And really that's it. There's not a whole lot of in between, which creates these really bold, strong images. And his use of negative space is just remarkable. The way that he uses negative space to create shape and form instead of just using it as something to make something else stand out. Like if you look at the tentacles or even Hellboy's coat in this image, the lines that aren't there create the form of his body. Um, and I think that's really, really cool the way he does that. So here are three images that I think represent his style very well. The image on the right is something that is very reminiscent of a lot of his work. And uh, I don't want to say that he copycats himself or rips himself off, but um, you'll see that big swooping shape in the background of a lot of his images. Uh, but it's because it works. It, you know, for what he is trying to do with that image, it creates space and design. And if you look at you know, the lines of the spears versus the lines of the shape behind it, it creates this really interesting pattern. The image on the left, uh, I'm a huge fan of because of its starkness. But again, you know, it's, it's a little harder to pick out because of the color. But, you know, if you take the color as the negative space and you look at the lion's teeth in the front, and his snout, the way he uses the black to create the form with what he is not drawing, I think is really his strong suit when it comes to his style. And, uh, and, and my boy here loves flowers. You'll see them constantly in his artwork. Uh, I think, you know, they're very, they're a very strong design element. So I, I can see why he chooses them. Smoke and birds and flowers. It's like the trifecta of Mike Mignola's style. And speaking of using negative space, here are two 
horror images, uh, classic horror images, Frankenstein and the Bride of Frankenstein and the Creature from the Black Lagoon. Let's take the image on the left first. You look at Frankenstein's coat, like, he doesn't have a right, uh, or rather, a left arm. Um, it is not drawn the way you would typically draw an arm because there are no lines that show where it is but you can see perfectly where it is because of the little pieces of white that create the folds in his sleeve and even the tiny tiny little bit of black um, on the outline of him that pokes out that creates where his sleeve ends because if you follow that to where his hand starts you can see that that creates the illusion of a sleeve and just the design and the composition of that image as a whole is remarkable similarly to the image on the right of the creature from the black lagoon you know the use of the black and the white, especially on the chain and his left leg. You know, he didn't draw a chain. He omitted a chain from the black of the rock. I just think that is such a smart and interesting way to create form out of something that's not there, rather than creating form for something that is there. He also has an incredibly strong sense of design. Um, there are the flowers again, and the smoke, and a bird. We've got all three here. You know, the image on the left is, I feel like, really unique with the, the layering of, of the barracuda head over the bird's head, and, you know, the shapes down at the bottom with the flower. It's just really interesting, you know, you take those out, it would still be a great illustration, but you put those in and all of a sudden it becomes a fully realized designed piece. And the image on the right is just a, a really wonderful, not quite abstracted, but because, you know, that, that is something where his, his work really kind of toes that line a little bit, or rides that line rather, where he practically abstract certain things, but it is still perfectly identifiable. You look at the Bride of Frankenstein and her entire body is just negative space, but you still get form and he uses that to make Frankenstein pop, who is completely black, but you still get form. It's just, I don't know how he pulls it off, but it's quite remarkable. So let's move on to storytelling. And I'm going to focus on visual storytelling as much as I can. You know, this isn't really about writing or story. It's about how he can tell a story with pictures and, and you know, some sound. These are two fairly similar scenes, or you get the same effect from them at least. So the image on the left, really, there's nothing happening in this scene, comparatively to a lot of comic pages you'll see. But the mood it creates in its pacing is what really drew me to that. Similarly, on the one on the right, you know, it has a little more story to it, but still, you know, you get these establishing chains, which really um, set up the mood you got Hellboy, and then that one clink sound, which is similarly to the bongs on the previous image. It, it says so much with this one little sound of this clink of these chains. You, you get the whole scene from that. And then you get the, the two shot of the angel, demon, devil person, and Hellboy. And then the close up, and then Hellboy gets blasted and you, you don't need anything more than that and you this the whole story is told right there like you can you can really just understand what's happening 
based totally on the visuals. And not only can you understand what's happening, but you get the feeling of what's happening because of how he paces it. So here's another two page spread, very similar in tone and theme as well. But I just want to illustrate again how well he does this. And not only that, these are just two absolutely beautiful pages. This, the bell that is sinking into the black, it helps to create, again, helps to create this mood of, of menacing, of something bad is about to happen. The, the sense of tension. And then he gets a nail jammed into his head. You know, it, just the, the choices he makes in how he creates a page and what he puts in panels and what he doesn't put in panels, I think is just so smart because it's easy to just show everything that's happening and forget about everything that's not. And when you add in elements that help to set the scene and help create the mood, it goes so far. These next two images, this is probably, for me at least, the single best page from a Hellboy comic. It, again, it is very similar in theme to the last few I've shown, but it is just masterfully done. You get this the same sense of tension and just these beautiful panels of these flowers and this bird who stopped singing and this hissing through the flowers and it just creates this pacing. I think a lot of times, and I, I, I'm guilty of this myself, you know, I'll skim over pages and, you know, jump to the next word bubble. But when you really take a moment to read it panel by panel and you think about the pacing of it in that way, it really changes the way you read the page. You know, it's easy to look at the establishing shot and then skim down to where he says, oh, son of a, and then you're like, okay, I'm going to turn the page. But when you look at it through the lens of actually taking each panel as time, it, it really changes the, the page and it really changes how the page is read. Speaking of time, this is another really great page and, and it illustrates something that uh, I want to talk about with both of these pages. So Hellboy's looking at his watch, you hear the creak, his clock strikes 12, and he looks back and the corpse is hanging from this rope that was previously empty and it points and it tells him that these people are coming. But there's something that we realize subconsciously when we're reading comics, but we don't really think about it that often, which is the space between panels and how that affects time. So you look at this page on the right, and you have this shot of Hellboy in the shadows, and then you have this creak and his watch. And then he looks over his shoulder, and there's the corpse. And you can look at that, and that all happens at once. But when you look at it from a perspective of the borders being time, and the pace that creates of this creaking gallows, and this ticking watch, and the almost drum-like pacing it creates, in between the panels, stuff is still happening. Because the way the medium of comics works, you can only show shots from moments because otherwise it's animation if you do every second so what's left out is the in-between it's the white borders and those are used so well on these two pages the time in between the panels that he creates uh, and the choice of these additional panels which otherwise seem like decoration but when you look at them from the perspective of creating time and pace, I think it it really is creates something remarkable. So the last thing I want to talk about briefly is something called crossing the line, or also known as the 180 degree rule. And it is a filmmaking rule, which 
I found this diagram to try to illustrate, which is constantly broken and many times not intentionally. Filmmakers like Stanley Kubrick were known for breaking that rule, but you know, he did it with intention and I think a lot of people don't. They just do it out of, but it's extremely important in comics as well. And to try to explain this diagram, if you look at the one, two, and three cameras, the female character is always on the left side of the frame, even if she is the focus or not. And similarly for the male character, he is always on the right side of the frame. It keeps you visually understanding the space. So that line is, you know, when, when you say crossing the line, it, it is literally a line between these characters. And if you put a camera on the other side of that line and flip the positions of the two characters, it can confuse the viewer. So if you look at the t image from the two camera and the image from the wrong camera, if it cut from that two camera to the wrong camera, all of a sudden it looks like to your brain that male character just turned into the female character because they're occupying the same space. Whereas if you cut from the two camera to the three camera, you understand that it is just a reverse of what you were already looking at. So hopefully that all made sense. And I'm gonna show you some examples of how he does it very well. So here's a page from an issue of Hellboy. And you can see in all three of these panels, Hellboy is on the left side of the frame and the Demon King guy is on the right side of the frame. Even if the camera flips to behind Hellboy in the second panel and then back to behind the Demon King, Hellboy stays on the left. And as the fight continues and you go to the two shot, Hellboy is still on the left. If that flip flop and Hellboy was on the right of the image, suddenly it would be very jarring and confusing. So here is three pages of uh, a similar fight scene. And again, Hellboy's on the left. And even when he falls in the panel on the middle row of the page on the right, he's still falling to your eyes left. So he is falling leftwardly. Boy, I'm making up a lot of words today. Uh, but my point is that it never, quote, crosses the line. And that makes for a very easy viewing. You can understand the space the entire time. You understand the relationship of the characters to one another, not like if they're friends or not, because clearly they're, they're not buddies, but their spatial relationship to one another is very clear. And, you know, even if it's a tight shot or a wide shot, you still get the sense of where they are. And that's something that is, I can assure you, very intentional. But I've seen artists miss stuff like that a lot. So uh, it's just something that he does very well. So I'll leave you with one of my favorite Hellboy characters, Lobster Johnson. Just a great little sketch. Please let me know what you liked about this or what you didn't like, what you'd like to see differently, or what you'd like to stay the same. Either way, thanks for tuning in. I appreciate you spending some time with me and enjoying some great art. I hope I offered some new perspectives and let you see it possibly in a way that you haven't looked at it before. All right. That's going to do it. Thanks for watching. Never turn your back to the ocean.